So I think we'll, we'll get started, even though I know there's some more people will be dribbling in, but I want to make sure our speaker has all the time. So it's a pleasure to welcome our guest today, Dr. Brittany Howe. Uh, Brittany is a postdoctoral associate. I have written here a postdoctoral fellow, but I'll correct it. Postdoctoral associate in developmental psychology at the Institute for Child Development at the University of Minnesota in uh, Minneapolis. Uh, she did her undergraduate work in neuroscience and cell and molecular biology in New Orleans at Tulane University. Uh, she then went on to do her PhD in neuroscience at Emory, uh, working with Mars Sanchez at the Yerkes Primate Research Center uh, in Atlanta. And from there, she moved to Minneapolis for her postdoctoral work at the Institute for Child Development uh, at the University of Minnesota, working with Jed Ellison uh, most recently. Um, during her doctoral work, she uh, got very involved with imaging using uh, diffusion uh, weighted tensor DTI imaging to study adolescent recent rhesus monkeys, uh, macaques uh, in particular at the Yerkes Primate Center, uh, to, try to, uh, to get a handle and some insights on understanding uh, stress and the effects of stress on development of the brain. Looked at a variety of things including uh, neuroendocrine effects such as cortisol levels and these effects on the brain after stress uh, uh, induction. Uh, also looked particularly at social subordination stress uh, and the effects of different um, transporters, particularly serotonin transporter polymorphisms uh, in juvenile monkeys as well. Uh, and then went on to look at a variety of conditions creating uh, early adverse exposures and how that affected emotional reactivity in juvenile, again, uh, juvenile monkeys and uh, studied that in the context of circuits as relate to amygdala uh, stru structure and function. Uh, most recently, uh, in uh, Jed Ellison's lab at the University of Minnesota, she's become part of the uh, Human Baby Connectome Project. And uh, as I understand, it was very instrumental uh, in the award of the Brains R01 grant to uh, Dr. Ellison's uh, uh, organization, uh, looking at uh, development of baby brain over time. And in particular, she's been looking at the interaction of breast milk uh, feeding and the infant gut microbiome and brain and behavioral development and bringing to bear uh, her considerable expertise in neuroimaging as well in that area. Um, I should also add that uh, Dr. Howe's very involved with a lot of other things, including women in uh, science and women in neuroscience activities, and she has been from her graduate student days, postdoctoral days, and so forth at the national and university level. <clears throat> and she also has a keen interest and appreciation and love for dogs, which makes her a good person in my point of view to begin with. So without further ado, it's a pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Brittany Howe. Welcome, Brittany. Thank you for that introduction, and I will make sure to give Olive some extra snuggles and make sure she knows she was mentioned. <laughs> um, so thanks, everybody, for being here, including everyone in Blacksburg. Um, I'm really excited to be here and to share some of the work that I've done in the past in monkeys, and so some of the things that um, Dr. Friedlander highlighted, highlighted I'll be going over in more detail, um, but also what I'm doing currently in humans and where I hope to go. Because at the end of all of my work, I really hope to generate novel targets for interventions in a high-risk population. So for example, um, children growing up in poverty. So I'm going to start off by saying something that may be fairly obvious to most people, or maybe you haven't thought about it. And that's that babies depend on their caregivers. And this is particularly true in mammals, uh, certainly in primates. Uh, so in mammals, moms play with their babies as this polar bear mom is doing. Um, moms clean their babies. Moms provide nutrition to their babies. And moms certainly snuggle their babies. And this really defines infancy as a really unique period, this dependency on moms specifically. And it also makes moms a really salient part of the infant environment. <coughs> And what some uh, evidence that we have of the importance of moms in uh, neurodevelopment specifically is in animal models of maternal deprivation. And so uh, I first started my research career. I don't know that I knew it was a research career at that point. But as an undergrad working in uh, D. Higley's group out in Poolsville, if anybody's been out to the, monk the NIH monkey farm. And I was in charge of uh, non-monitoring the dominance hierarchies in the, the small social groups out there. And what caught my eye is that there were certain animals that were very, that behaved very, very differently. And I didn't quite know why until I started to talk to these. This was literally the first day I was there. And he said, oh, well, those are the peer-reared animals. And so peer-reared animals are removed from their mothers on the first day of life and are raised in a nursery by human caregivers for the first six months. And so if you multiply that by four, which is our kind of translation factor between monkey age and human age, that tells you it's about two years in, in human time. 
uh, after that time, at six months, all of the animals are pooled together. So animals that were raised by their mothers, so the mother-reared animals, are put together with the peer-reared animals, and they're all raised together after that. So this adversity is really limited to the first six months of life. But the animals that I was watching were six, seven, eight years old. And so there was something really special about that early period that was causing these differences in uh, behavioral outcomes. And if you look at these animals at 24 to 30 months, which is about 8 to 12 human years-ish, um, you do see differences in their brains at the structural level. And so there are some increases in some brain regions and some decreases in brain regional volumes. Um, but that the regions aren't super uh, important for right now. But the point I want to make is that even at you know, two years after this experience, we're starting to see differences in brain development. Interestingly, what we were trying to model with this kind of adversity uh, is uh, maternal deprivation in humans, and specifically orphanage rearing. And so I'm going to talk about one study of orphanage rearing, so the Bucharest Early Intervention Project. It's a really interesting project and pretty landmark because it was one of the first times that we were able to randomly assign babies to, a, uh, to an intervention after this kind of uh, at deprivation. And so what they did, uh, so this is uh, Nathan Fox and Chuck Nelson and Charles Zena, they uh, were able to randomly assign babies in ro from Romanian orphanages to care as usual or to foster care and follow them up longitudinally. And they're in ad into their 20s now following up this, these cohorts. Um, but some of the evidence that I'm going to show you right now of the importance of having a mom there uh, is looking uh, at the brain using EEG. And so in this particular study, they were looking at the alpha power band with EEG, so the alpha power band, uh, the power of the alpha band, I'm sorry, increases during development and is thought to re be related to arousal and attention, uh, and it correlates with cognitive performance. And so this is important because we know that children with these histories of early adversity struggle cognitively, as well as with some social uh, deficits and things. That's just that. But if you look at the care as usual group, oh, here, I have a pointer. The care as usual group here, they have a, de uh, um, they have a decrease in the power of the alpha band that's comparable to a subset of the foster care group. And the subset of the foster care group are those that were placed in foster care older than two years. So that two year mark should sound familiar because that's exactly the time period that we were altering in the monkey model. However, if you look at the foster care group that uh, were placed in foster care prior to turning two, they look remarkably similar to the non-institutionalized group. And so there's something, if we can intervene early, and, and this is suggesting prior to two years, then maybe we can shift the developmental trajectories away from the poor outcomes associated with these kinds of early adversities. And this was shown across the brain as well. So it wasn't only in temporal regions, but it was in frontal, central, parietal, and occipital regions as well. And so this idea that early experiences can affect brain development, or just brain and behavioral development, is this idea of developmental programming. And one of the core tenets of developmental programming is that systems that are changing rapidly are going to be the ones that are most vulnerable or sensitive to the environment. And one example here um, that I'm going to show, show you is from a single individual that I scanned at the University of Minnesota at 3, 9, 12, and 24 months. I don't think anybody needs to be a trained radiologist to see the huge differences in both the T1 structural and the T2 structural images between three and 24 months in this individual. There are changes in shape, there are changes in volume. If you look at intensities, there are differences in intensities. So in the T1, the brighter the, um, the voxel, so that 3D pixel, the uh, higher fat content. So that's how we can look at things like myelinated white matter bundles. Uh, and then in the T2, it's the same anatomical structures, but the contrast is flipped. So actually, white matter is dark in, in the T2. To look at this a different way, at the group level, if we look at uh, this study that came out of, um, out of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill from John Gilmore's group, they looked at 95 infants that were scanned as neonates at 12 months and again at 24 months. And so this is really getting at developmental trajectory, not just age-related change. Um, so it's a subtle difference, but something um, that is important uh, to my thinking about these questions. And what you see are drastic changes in cerebral volume across the, 20, the first 24 months of life. Again, suggesting that the brain is rapidly changing and that these are systems that are likely sensitive to early experience, and particularly, again, to shifts in maternal uh, care. Because, uh, as I said before, uh, moms are really a, one, arguably the most salient part of the infant environment. And so my overarching research question is really, given that moms are so salient for infants, how is it that moms are impacting neurodevelopment? And specifically, through what plausible biological pathways 
are moms affecting your development in their babies? And so my framework starts with mom. And my, my kind of construct of mom includes her physical health, her mental health, and her life history. Those characteristics can then have effects on how she cares for her infants, how she pass, what microbes she passes on to her baby, and the constituents in her breast milk, which all then can feed into a, a changing the brain and behavior in her infant. Uh, and so this framework is really interdisciplinary and really collaborative. Um, but I hope by the end of my talk, you'll be convinced that we should be looking at all of these things at once, that we're, there's a lot to be gained by understanding how maternal care and the microbiota and milk all at once come together to affect neurodevelopment. So the first piece of evidence I'm gonna to talk to you about is my, uh, some work I did as a graduate student. So after working with the monkeys uh, in Poolsville, I was, in, I was enthralled by this idea that something that happens so early can have such long-lasting effects. And so I wanted to dig in more to that idea. And I wanted to specifically see what is happening during infant, infancy. So we know there are these long-term changes, but what's happening during the experience and potentially uh, shortly thereafter. And so as a graduate student, I worked with Mar Sanchez, who was looking at how adverse maternal care in the form of infant maltreatment affected brain development. And so this isn't quite as harsh of a, of a manipulation as the maternal deprivation model. And what's nice about this model is it's actually completely naturalistic. So we didn't do anything to incite this behavior in our monkeys. It happens at about two to 5% uh, frequency, which is interesting because that's very similar to the rates that you see in humans as well. I, I operationalized uh, adverse maternal care as being both physical abuse and rejection. And so uh, if you look at the plot here, this just shows that physical abuse is highest at month one and then drops precipitously down to three months. And that's likely because the infants are able to run away uh, so we don't see as much abuse. Uh, and this is a species aberrant behavior. You never see these behaviors in competent mothers. In contrast, this idea of rejection, which is thought to kind of parallel human neglect, is a species typical behavior. But in our maltreating moms, the timing is what's aberrant. And so normally, you would see this kind of behavior during, during weaning, which starts at about six months, because that's when mom is starting to breed. And then it typically ramps up until mom has another baby, and she'll continually remove her older infant from nursing. Um, in our maltreating moms, though, they're rejecting at pretty high rates starting at month one, which is really odd, because these are babies that can't, I mean, they can move a little bit, but they really do need their mothers. Um, what's interesting about this study, and what was really important about this study, is in order to disentangle the effects of the actual experience versus any prenatal or heritable factors, I was able to cross foster these babies on the day of birth. And so they were randomly assigned to an adversity. So in the Bucharest Early Intervention Project that I spoke about, there was random assignment to an intervention. And we do lots of intervention studies where kids are randomly assigned to different interventions. But we can't assign infants to adversity. We can assign monkeys to adversity, and that's, that is the only real way to disentangle those experiential effects versus, the, um, versus any prenatal or heritable effects. And what I can also do in monkeys that we can do in humans, but is, can be trickier because we don't have large corrals of humans for us to pull from, um, but we can follow them longitudinally, and we can assess how these changes occur across time. So again, looking at developmental trajectories and how those are potentially affected by these differences in early experience versus just looking at age-related change. Uh, and so for this study, I collected both structural and diffusion data. We also have some resting state functional. I'm not going to talk about those results today, though. Uh, and after uh, six years of data collection and kind of producing these animals and cross-fostering, uh, I ended up with 42 animals total, 20 of which were raised by controls. Uh, mothers and 22 which were maltreated. And this uh, table just shows you the breakdown. So an M to M animal was born to a maltreating mom but raised by an unrelated maltreating mother and then born to a control raised by maltreating, et cetera, just in case you're curious about the breakdown. So we did have crosses every which way. No one was raised by their biological mother in this particular study. Uh, we had MRI assessments at two weeks, three months, six months, 12 months, and 18 months. And again, to, if you multiply by four, that gives you an idea of kind of the developmental stage we're looking at in human time. And so that would be about a two-month-old human, a one-year-old, a two-year-old, a four-year-old, and a six-year-old, just to orient people. And so in case you haven't gotten a chance to see what the developing macaque brain looks like, uh, here's one example. This is a single individual that was scanned at 
each of the time points throughout the study. And again, the first column is a T1-weighted image, and the second column is a T2-weighted image. Um, and what's really nice about these data is we collected, these were at um, 0.8 millimeter isotropic, so they were pretty high resolution data. And what that allowed us to do uh, was to develop these tools for other researchers working with infant monkeys. So when I started these studies, there were tools out there, some anyway, for infant human studies, and those were still kind of just being developed. There, was, there wasn't anything equivalent for monkeys at all. And so I spent a long time hand coat, hand drawing on MRIs um, because it was, uh, what we needed to do was make sure that we had the tools available so that we could use, uh, oops, so we could use the automatic segmentation pipelines that were being implemented in human infants. And so using the atlas that I helped build, uh, I was able to save myself hundreds, probably thousands of hours of work and get really high quality volumes as well. And these are publicly available um, for anyone who's interested in doing monkey infant imaging. And so if I looked for differences in just kind of the three major tissue classes as, are, as, as what's segmented here, so the green is gray matter, the red is white matter, and then the blue is CSF. If I look to see, are there differences based on the experience of maltreatment? And again, I can say it's the experience because of the experimental design. I do see a reduction in total brain volume in maltreated infants. Uh, and this was across 3, 6, and 12. We now have replicated this at the 18-month time point as well. And what's interesting about this is that we, these are similar changes to what, you would, what we see in um, maternally deprived humans. And so those post-institutionalized kids, we see reductions in brain volume as well. If we dig a little deeper and see what this, total, what this difference in total brain volume may be driven by, it's not gray matter, but it does appear to be uh, white matter. So there is a, a experience, an effective experience on white matter volume, and our maltreated infants actually have decreased white matter volume. Uh, which brings me to the question of why white matter? Why would white matter specifically be sensitive, or why should we even care about white matter? And I think for a long time, white matter was thought to be static. Right? Once those connections develop and they're myelinated, they're there, they don't change, they just facilitate efficient electric connections between cortical regions, and that's it. Um, we, there's a lot of work now that suggests that that is not the case at all, that white matter is actually very dynamic and changes in response to experience. And so this is just one example of a kind of fun study where they scanned uh, participants prior to being trained to juggle and then after they were trained. And what they found were alterations in white matter that we know support things like hand motor coordination. And so this suggests that via very, very simple manipulation, like training for juggling, we can see differences in white matter. And this was over a two-week period. So this is not you know, years and years and years of training. These are you know, short-term uh, changes. And they didn't follow up to see if it lasted for years and years. That, that I can't say. But if we do look over the course of years and during the first few years of life, we know that myelin, specifically, in the brain does predict later cognitive outcomes. And so babies who have higher myelin content in these regions early on tend to have higher cognitive scores. And this is the Mullen scales of early learning for people who are curious um, later on. So there's some, there seems to be an important role for white matter, specifically early in life, in cognitive development. And then finally, looking back at some of the findings that have been published from, again, from the Bucharest Early Intervention Project, uh, they do see long-term alterations in white matter. So this is, again, when they're eight years old. Um, and they see lots of changes in their decreases in fractional anisotropy that are actually mitigated by placement in foster care. So again, if we can get to kids early, then we may be able to shift those developmental trajectories, and specifically in white matter. But we can do better than just looking at white matter volume. And that's through using diffusion MRI. And so I'm just going to give a quick, quick overview of what diffusion MRI is. And so uh, DMRI is really just a spin haha, on a traditional MRI, and it measures diffusion in the brain. And why that's important is because diffusion is actually uh, restricted perpendicular to axon bundles, but not along the axon bundle. And this, this directional diffusion that's caused by this restriction uh, it gives us an indication of the structural organization of the white matter bundle. Now, the cellular uh, characteristics of the individual axons that feed into this kind of macroscopic uh, measure include things like the caliber of the axons, the thickness of the myelin sheath, the number of axons, how tightly they're packed. Uh, so it's not just a measure of myelin, not at all. But it still gives us this really nice uh, 
indication of the underlying microstructural organization of that white matter bundle. And so the specific metric that's used to, to look at this underlying organization is called fractional anisotropy, which is a pretty straightforward idea once you stop and think about it. And so in a voxel or again a 3D pixel within an image where you uh, don't expect, there isn't a tissue that's restricting diffusion, you would see diffusion equal in all directions and that would be isotropic. So no fractional anisotropy, very low fractional anisotropy. However, in tissue like in a white matter bundle where there is restriction again perpendicular to the bundle but not along the bundle, then you would see high fractional anisotropy. And what we can do is we can actually fit tensor models and other models as well. Uh, to each voxel, and then we can run what we ca uh, call streamlines through them to connect them and to actually track white matter bundles in vivo. And this is really exciting for a developmentalist, right? Because prior to this, if you wanted to look developmentally, you had to sacrifice animals. And I don't know if any of you have tried to bring an animal back to life to see how it will develop. It's not easy to do. So being able to look at these things in vivo was huge for even an animal researcher, never mind the implications for human research. And so in our sample of maltreated infants, I applied this atlas-based tracked profile approach, which is kind of a mouthful, um, but I want to talk a little bit about it because I think it's really important uh, for a couple of reasons. So basically what I did, in addition to making those structural atlases, I also made a diffusion atlas. And so that's one common 3D space that all of the subjects contribute data to. Within that 3D space, I can use tractography, like I just showed, using DTI, to map all of the white matter bundles. I can then propagate those bundles from the atlas back to each individual. And what's important about that is that I'm confident that I'm using this, that I'm measuring the same uh, bundle in each subject, but I'm allowing each subject to have its own slight variations in shape and size. And we certainly know that that's true uh, of brain structures in adults, and that's certainly true in, in developing uh, animals as well. And so what you end up with is not just an average fractional anisotropy measure across a white matter bundle, but I can, I can actually extract fractional anisotropy measures across the physical extent of the tract, and that's all that's shown on the x-axis here, is the actual physical um, length of the tract. And then the fractional anisotropy is mapped along it, and this isn't showing any uh, group comparisons, these are just the left and right tracks uh, plotted together. But what I wanted to point out first is that fractional anisotropy is increasing across development in all of these bundles. And this has been replicated in lots of human studies and other animal work as well. Absolutely. So this is this is group, and the shading. Yep, and the shading are. Yep, yep, the shading are confidence intervals, ninety-five percent. Yep. And so we actually don't. It's funny because we saw less variance at younger ages than at older ages, which is counter to what a lot of human researchers have reported. And I, I can't speak to exactly why that is, um, but we we dug in, and this is we do see less variance early on. And I want, so in addition to the uh, fractional anisotropy or this organization of the white matter bundles increasing across time, uh, then that was true for all of the bundles that I, I looked at. Um, I chose these three specifically to show you because they are, are all thought to play a role in kind of the etiology of psychopathology. And so the uncinate fasciculus, which I'll show you a picture of in just a second, but it's a small white matter bundle that connects the medial prefrontal cortex with the amygdala. And it's thought to play a really important role in the top-down control of, of amygdala function and play a big role in emotion regulation, which we know children with adverse histories struggle with. So this was where we were putting most of our eggs, was in the uncinate basket. Um, the inferior longitudinal fasciculus, I, in previous work I had found that in adolescence, there were alterations in fractional anisotropy in animals that had experienced maltreatment. Um, and so I threw that in there as well. And the middle longitudinal fasciculus is another one of these bundles that connects parietal cortex with more interior structures and is thought to play a role in social communication and social behavior. And so we know those are, those are areas where people with adverse early <clears throat> caregiving struggle. So this is where I thought I would find, find differences. And when I look at in the maltreated animals, I do, in fact, see global effects. So these are global, meaning across the entire tract. Uh, I do see effects in the bilateral middle longitudinal fasciculus. So that's this guy. It's hard to, that one there. Uh, and only on the right inferior longitudinal fasciculus. I didn't see anything in the uncinate. Now, this method, using this atlas-based tract profile approach, I can look beyond just global effects, and I can look to see where there are differences along the tract. 
uh, and this is interesting, when you look at the middle longitudinal fasciculus, it's the anterior portion that's actually, that shows the most uh, deficit, the, the most decreases in fractional anisotropy in response to maltreatment. And that's exactly where the middle longitudinal fasciculus meets the uncinate fasciculus. And so when I saw this, it got me thinking, perhaps we shouldn't be thinking of white matter bundles as, as a single white matter bundle subserving a certain function or an outcome. But maybe we should think about them in networks. We know that the brain works in networks functionally, and so why wouldn't, you know, why not have white matter networks as well? And I'm gonna come back to that uh, towards the end of my talk, but I'm planting the seed now. So my interim conclusions are really that there, are evident, there is evidence for developmental programming in neurodevelopment, uh, and particularly white matter, uh, that the effects of adverse caregiving are long-lasting, and finally, it's important to me that we are, that as people studying human infants, that we're paying attention to animal studies. Uh, so I didn't just randomly shift to humans. I, I wanted to study humans because I wanted to be a truly translational neuroscientist. And I think understanding and having that hands-on experience with actual human infants is really valuable in being able to translate uh, the animal work into the, the human work, particularly when at the, goal, when at the end of the day, the goal is to develop interventions. But what I just showed you speaks a lot to what happens when maternal behavior is altered, but it didn't say much about biological pathways. And so now I'm going to bring us back to my kind of conceptual framework here, and I'm gonna focus on convincing you that we should be paying attention to milk. And so this idea of lactational programming uh, was kind of pioneered by Katie Hind. And so she was interested in the, initially anyway, in just the caloric content in milk and how that was predictive of behavior in rhesus monkeys. And so what she found is that milk that had more, more energy in it, so with higher calorie content, actually predicted higher confidence, and this is her construct, uh, during a stressful encounter uh, only in females, female monkeys. This is the very first suggestion that there's something in milk, here she's suggesting it's just energy, that is predictive of temperament in, in offspring. This uh, line of work has grown substantially and so now there are replications of similar effects on temperament, um, but these have been linked specifically to milk cortisol, and I'm gonna talk about cortisol in, uh, more specifically in a second. Um, but in this study, they found similar things, uh, but they were looking at the uh, negative affectivity portion of the infant behavior questionnaire, for people who are, are familiar with that, and if mom produced milk with higher cort, then infants had higher negative affectivity. Um, there's a lot of work now showing that or uh, showing that breastfeeding is actually uh, linked with improved cognitive um, performance. Uh, and so there are some studies that go all the way out into adulthood, and that suggests that if you were breastfed, that you will be smarter. Um, take that for, for what, <laughs> what you will, because breastfeeding is a very complex uh, process. But there are other studies that are showing that breastfeeding does affect uh, brain size and white matter specifically, and there are even more specific studies looking specifically at myelin and white matter, and that breastfeeding does seem to affect uh, myelin content. And then interestingly, breastfeeding seems to, uh, seems to flatten out developmental trajectories, so allow, it seems to support this protracted development of myelin. So not necessarily faster is better, right? And this is about, uh, there's, there is also some evidence that breastfeeding can affect uh, EEG measures in babies, uh, but we don't have really any more ideas about what specifically in breast milk is are causing these differences. Uh, and that's really a big gap in the literature that I'm planning to fill um, with my research program. So I don't have much more to show you as far as lactational programming, not yet anyway. But I do hope that I've given you hints that there are links. And now I wanna talk a little bit about specific mechanisms through which milk can affect neurodevelopment. And when you think about early adversity, the usual suspect is certainly cortisol. So cortisol is the end product of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, or the HPA axis. So the HPA axis is, in, is an endocrine axis that is um, kind of, you consider it starting in the brain. It's controlled by uh, regions of the prefrontal cortex as well as the amygdala and the hippocampus. When this axis is activated, the hypothalamus produces corticotropin releasing hormone and adenine vasopressin, which act on the pituitary, which then releases adrenocorticotropic hormone into the general circulation, which acts on the adrenal cortex, which produces cortisol and releases that into the general circulation. And so most of the work that's looked at early adversity really thinks that it's the activation of this axis within the infant that's causing an increase in endogenous cortisol 
and that it's that exposure to high, that chronic exposure to high levels of cortisol that are resulting in the, alt, in the, the poor neurodevelopmental outcomes. But what I want to suggest is that there's also cortisol in breast milk and that that may be having an effect on neurodevelopment as well. So we know that breast milk contains cortisol. Uh, it follows the same diurnal rhythm that cortisol uh, follows. And there was actually, in this particular study, I think the correlation was between 0.8 and 0.9 for, uh, for uh, uh, correlation between serum and, and breast milk cort. And then interestingly, if in a lactating rat, you dose her with corticosterone, so the rodent equivalent of cortisol, you dose her water with corticosterone, you see increases in the corticosterone in stomach milk of her pups, not in the serum or the blood of her pups, but you do see it increased in brain. And so there's something special about breast milk cortisol that is leading to an increase in corticosterone in the brain. Now, this wasn't a labeled study, so we don't know if it was that the specific court that mom was providing, but even if it's through an indirect mechanism, it's still causing um, CNS levels of cortisol to increase. And then finally, um, there's some evidence that milk cortisol does predict uh, reactions to a fear task in a laboratory environment. And what's interesting about this is that fear reactivity and behavioral inhibition, all of those things are risk factors for developmental psychopathology that is enriched in kids with early adversities. And it seems, again, this is mod, uh, seems to be predicted by court, and it's in girls. Again, there where they see these effects. And so this may be a specific pathway through which we're um, differentially uh, making females susceptible to psychopathology. So something else to consider within this framework. And so cortisol isn't the only pathway through which, my, uh, through which milk may affect neurodevelopment. Um, effects on the microbiome are actually uh, very plausible. And that's because uh, we understand that the milk, uh, that breast milk has a special relationship with the microbiome. So milk itself has its own microbiome, so its own set of microbes. Uh, it's distinct from both maternal stool, which is shown in blue here, and areolar skin, which is in yellow. So a mom is not only providing these microbes to her baby, she's also providing food for those microbes. And so the third most common component in breast milk is actually uh, human, our human milk oligosaccharides. There are about 200 different HMOs in breast milk. Uh, and what's interesting about them is that babies cannot digest them directly. But the microbes that mom, mom is giving to baby through breast milk can. And the byproducts of that metabolism are short-chain fatty acids, which we know are important for a whole host of, um, of physiological processes. And then finally, if we look at the microbiomes of infants who are exclusively breastfed versus those who are exclusively formula fed, they're distinct. So there's something special about breast milk that's supporting, that's supporting a specific uh, microbiome in baby. Now, why should we care about the microbiome? So I've shown you that milk is important for the microbiome, and there is a wealth of evidence accruing that the microbiome is particularly important for brain development. And so this is really focusing on how the gut-brain axis uh, develops. Uh, so the gut-brain axis is really just this bidirectional communication between the microbes in your gut and your brain. And this happens through lots of parallel pathways. Um, so in babies, I spoke about human milk oligosaccharides and how the bugs digest them and then release these short-chain fatty acids. Um, microbes can also produce um, other bioactive factors. So microbes can produce neurotransmitters themselves. Excuse me, they can cause the endothelial cells to release different immune factors and different, um, different hormones. Um, the immune cells can then react to the composition of the gut microbiome. And there is a direct connection via the vagus nerve. And there's some evidence that the brain can actually detect microbes faster than the immune system does via the vagus. And so there's the other information needed or being used by the brain besides just there's an intruder, we need to attack it. Um, we're, this is still, this field is still really in its infancy, but some of the best evidence is actually coming out of animal work in which uh, mice are raised without any exposure to microbes. So these are germ-free mice, not gluten-free mice, although I always want to say gluten-free whenever I see GF. Um, and if you look in germ-free animals, they show this very specific phenotype. And so there are deficits in recognition memory and social behavior and, and anxiety. Uh, and there are increases in locomotion 
and self-grooming. And what's interesting about these behaviors is a lot of these behaviors are thought to model some of the symptoms of psychopathologies, including depression, anxiety, and autism, all three of which have, been, have had microbiota um, dysbioses identified within them. If you look biologically, these animals have decreases in brain-derived neurotrophic factor with increases in serotonin and then two components of the HPA axis, so adrenal corticotropic hormone and corticosterone. And there are very complex changes in, in other neuronal processes as well. But important for my line of work is this finding that in germ-free animals, the myelin sheath in the frontal cortex in, in germ-free mice is actually thickened developmentally. And this is shown here. So this is a single axon in, in an electron micrograph, and this uh, myelin sheath is roughly two or three times as thick as in controls. And so this is suggesting that at least having a microbiome is important for uh, brain development. Now this is a sledgehammer approach, right? We're not subtly doing anything to the microbiome. We're eliminating it completely. And so to really, uh, again, thinking back to translation, there really isn't an equivalent human condition. You would never find a human without any microbes. But if you do look in kind of the messier uh, data, looking in the microbiome of humans, um, my collaborator at Michigan State, Rebecca Nickmeyer, published one of the first papers to show that there are associations between the composition of the gut microbiome. And for people who are curious, um, it's bacterioides that seem to be predicting a better cognitive development later in life. So if you have more bacterioides during your first year of life, then you're doing better cognitively later. In this same cohort, she was able to show that this may be due to differences in functional connectivity uh, with the amygdala and other cortical regions, and, and cortical regions. So these are really the first papers to come out that show that developmentally, and specifically in infancy, the microbiome is important for behavioral development and uh, function. And so I want to bring back to my framework again, really said, hopefully I've convinced you that the relationship between milk and the microbiome in the brain and milk and direct effects on the brain are really important things to study. And if you remember when I very first started talking about developmental programming, one of the core tenets of developmental programming is that the systems that are developing rapidly are the ones that are going to be most sensitive. And so this is some work that I've done as part of the baby connectome. So I, I um, collected these samples and analyzed them as well. Uh, and what this is showing is that there's huge change during roughly the first two years of life in the gut microbiome. And so I don't care if anyone remembers any of the specific bacterial families, but remember that there's drastic change. And we know that this isn't random change. A lot of these changes are due to cessation of breastfeeding, to introduction of solid foods. These are all things that we can look at in, within a population to really understand how developmental trajectories are being shifted. And if I overlay this time period with some of the cellular processes that are happening at the same time that may affect white matter later, an interesting pattern comes out, right? So gliogenesis is occurring postnatally. So this is in uh, contrast to neurogenesis, which is mostly done at birth. Uh, the uh, progenitor cells for glia are actually differentiating and migrating during this time. Uh, there's huge increases in synapse overproduction here that's then much later in life uh, pruned down with experience. And both of these things together really set up the brain for myelination later. And so myelination is a really protracted process that does start prenatally but extends all the way into early adulthood. But if these processes are not, are affected by things happening in the gut, uh, then that may set us, set um, kids, especially kids with early adverse histories uh, on different developmental trajectories. And so now I want to talk about what I'm doing currently to look at this in humans. So I've talked a lot about monkeys and a lot about ongoing work and kind of the paucity of data that we have within single cohorts in all of these things. So we have bits and pieces, but we don't know how these systems interact because no one really has those data. We don't know how breast milk affects the microbiota and then the brain because we don't have those measures in the same cohort. And so I'm looking at these questions uh, as part of the Baby Connectome Project. And so the Baby Connectome really started as an R01 in my uh, postdoc mentor, Jed Ellison's group. Uh, and he had money to look at 60 mother-infant pairs uh, from three months all the way through 24 months. Um, while uh, when I very first started, uh, we were getting geared up to start this, this project. Uh, and I asked if I could get 
stool samples and milk samples to look at some of the biological pathways that I've been talking to you about. And Jed was very open to it, but of course you need funding. So I applied for a supplement to his R01, and I was able to get money to collect from 45 of those 60. So I was thinking, awesome, this is great preliminary data for an R01, great. Then the RFA for the Baby Connect Home Project came out, and we were successful in putting in a collaborative uh, grant with the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, which increased our sample size from 60 to 500 kids. And so we were assessing brain development and behavioral development uh, from birth, so two weeks old, all the way through five years. 285 of those kids we are assessing longitudinally, uh, and this is using an accelerated longitudinal design, which I'll show in a plot in just a second. And then we'll have an additional 215 cross-sectionally. So the original project, again, was just behavior and neuroimaging. Um, not just any neuroimaging, these are really uh, high resolution, cutting edge techniques being applied uh, from the human connectome project down to the babies in the baby connectome. And so I was you know, very happy with my 45 kids and Nestle approached me and asked if I would be willing to collect in the entire baby connectome sample. And I said, of course, I would love to collect more poop and more milk uh, along with detailed diet records. And so I had expanded my original efforts to include all of the Baby Connect Home kids up through 36 months. And so I'm about 18 months out now from finishing collection in the Baby Connect Home project. Um, and again, we're collecting behavior, uh, human connectome compatible MRI, including structural diffusion and resting state. And I am heading the efforts to collect uh, stool samples for, to, to look at the fecal microbiome as well as milk. And in addition, I'm getting a lot of metadata because the idea here is to control for these factors that we already know have, have an effect. So uh, we are getting lots and lots of information about antibiotic use and uh, mode of delivery. And we're getting, excuse me, some of the best information we can about infant diet because we're getting milk samples. And so instead of just asking how long are you breastfeeding or you know, what frequency are you breastfeeding, I have all of that information as well as uh, milk itself. And so this is a longitudinal sample plot, and I'll show you one other in just a second. And the uh, important thing to note about this is that every horizontal line is a single subject, and every point is when I have a sample in hand right now. Uh, if the point is, uh, is an orange triangle, then that is a sample that I have a fecal as well as a concurrent milk sample. And if it's a green circle, then I only have fecal. And I wanted to point out, and this is only in the University of Minnesota, uh, UNC's efforts uh, are a little behind ours because we had started that R01 earlier. Um, but I, what I wanted to point out is the unique opportunity here to look at breastfeeding in a, very, um, in a very focused way and to dig into the actual aspects of breast milk that are going to be affecting our imaging uh, data, which are shown here. So again, this is a longitudinal sample plot. So every horizontal is a single individual, and every point is where we have a successful scan, here defined as getting a usable T1 and T2. And we're also collecting resting state and diffusion. Um, but if you can imagine, it's, it can be difficult to keep a baby asleep that long. But I wanted to take this opportunity to talk about some of the kind of practical skills that I had to troubleshoot when we very first started this. So Jed hadn't scanned a single baby when I started as a postdoc, and I was tasked with setting up the lab for scanning. Uh, and so there were things that I hadn't ever considered, like how do you make a scan room completely dark? And so we suction cupped room blackening curtains onto the front of the scanner. How do you make it quiet enough so that a baby doesn't wake up during those sounds? And that's lining the bore with sound attenuating foam and figuring out what earplugs are best for little tiny baby ears. Because again, we're scanning starting in, in Minnesota at one month of age. Uh, and then additionally, once they start to get older and they're not falling asleep in mom or dad's arms, how do you get them asleep and to stay asleep? And so I actually designed an MR safe crib. Um, I should have version one up here because <laughs> it's nowhere near as pretty as this one. It was made out of PVC pipe and Gorilla Glue and plastic chicken wire and zip ties. And I made it in my living room. Um, my older daughter, who was a toddler at the time, was happy to help me test it out. Um, but I actually then, that was working pretty well, but you know, we're trying to, to make sure that things are as stable as possible and there wasn't any way to really clip it into the, the scanner bed. And so what I did, I worked with a design firm and we designed this crib that actually does snap down. And what's nice about that is we can snap it down at the beginning of the scan, put a baby in, let them fall asleep, and then it's really lightweight and we can just lift it off. It sounds trivial and I feel like I've spent a lot of time talking about it, but this increased our success rate, especially for those 10 to 15-ish month olds. 
So the overall success rate at Minnesota now is right around 80%, and we've collected almost uh, 500 successful scans. I have uh, been at roughly 600 hours of those scans, personally. Lots of late nights. And so, as I said, I'm about 18 months out from finishing data collection on Connectome. And so right now I'm at the stage where I'm trying to think of how am I going to analyze these data to speak to this framework? Because this framework has the big data problem in a big way, right? So microbiome data, in and of itself, you get abundances for thousands of different taxa. Uh, milk, if you want, you can measure the thousands of different components in breast milk. And neuroimaging, certainly, if you look voxel-wise, there are thousands upon thousands of voxels that you could be looking at. And so what I'm trying to do in, in all of my analyses is really uh, reduce dimensionality, but in a developmentally informed way. And so one of the approaches that I'm taking is actually looking for developmental patterns within white matter bundles. And so what I've done here is applied a factor analysis framework uh, to fractional anisotropy along white matter bundles. And so uh, a four-factor solution worked at both at 6, 12, and 24 months. And basically what this is showing is which white matter tracks are correlated with each other within each age. And so there are, I don't have time to go into a lot of the specifics here. But what I want to point out is that we've reduced, you know, I think there were 46 tracks altogether down in, to 40, from 46 individual measures to four at each age, potentially, because you can see how well an individual fits this factor structure. And it's interesting because there are some bundles that are correlated across all three of these developmental periods, and there are others that shift, like the cortical spinal tracts. And so the idea here is to use this developmentally informed uh, dimension reduction to then in integrate milk measures. And my uh, approach to this is to not use a metabolomics approach and measure every possible thing you possibly could in milk, but to really use more evidence-based uh, an evidence-based approach. And so to target things like cortisol and other stress biomarkers that we know are extra nutritive and are being passed uh, to baby, particularly in highly stressed populations. And then to use, again, after reducing the uh, dimensionality of the microbiome data by looking for patterns, using uh, those patterns to see if they moderate any of the relationships between very specific milk components and adherence to these developmental patterns. Uh, so my take-home messages really are that early experiences do affect white matter organization specifically. And there is evidence for lactational programming, but we are really lacking the prospective and longitudinal data, particularly from a neurodevelopmental point of view. And that's something that my, uh, my program of research will fill, specifically looking at the modulation um, of the infant gut microbiome by milk and subsequent effects on neurodevelopment. And then my ongoing analyses uh, using the Baby Connectome Project are really going to be key in establishing good baseline measures and a good comparison group for future studies. And so I have a couple of a couple, uh, grants and projects that I'm hoping to, that I uh, am going to be proposing. Uh, the first is actually going to happen in October. And this is just looking at stress biomarkers in breast milk. Um, so I have the samples, but I don't have the money for the assays for these things. Um, Nestle is not particularly interested in cortisol and breast milk go figure, even though that was my, one of the main outcome measures that I was interested in when I first started collecting milk. And so I'm going, I'm putting in an, uh, an application to NICHD with Ellen Demrath, who is in public health at the University of Minnesota, and she's interested in how maternal obesity confers risk for obesity uh, to their infants through differences in milk composition. And so we'll be using her uh, milk samples from her ongoing study, um, baby connectome samples, as well as some donor milk samples. So this is a huge public health issue in that a lot of women are giving their babies donor milk. We know macronutrient and some micronutrient-wise what we're giving babies, and we have no idea what we're giving them as far as immune factors or stress hormones. We, we just have no clue. And so getting an idea of the range that we're providing babies could be important. Um, what's interesting about this study is then I'll have these stress biomarkers, and so we'll have cortisol and pro-inflammatory cytokines in breast milk in the baby connectome sample, and so I can link those to brain development. And because I also have the fecal samples, I can look for patterns in the microbiome that are predicted by those levels of stress hormones and then affect subsequent brain and behavior development. 
And the project that I'm most excited about is one that I think is, is particularly well suited for uh, Roanoke specifically, and that's looking at the role of breastfeeding uh, in resilience to poverty. And so I hypothesize that breastfeeding is actually a protective factor. We know that breastfeeding is lower in low-income communities. Uh, and so I, I am hoping to look at, and I'm going to expand on this greatly during my talk talk tomorrow, but I'm hoping to look at the roles of breastfeeding and uh, the microbiome in brain development in children growing up in poverty with the explicit uh, goal of using the BCP as a comparison sample. And so I need to end with acknowledgments. I don't have time to say the names of all of these people. There are so many people helping with this project. Um, but I do have to give special thanks to my PhD advisor, Mar Sanchez, down here, and my uh, postdoc mentor, Jed Elison, up here with his son, Kit, actually, who has been a pilot for a lot of things as well. Um, and then, of course, our funding uh, agencies. And last but absolutely not least, all of the participants, both human and non-human. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. I love pediatricians for lots of reasons. So a lot of disagreeing that's been working, it has it has a lot of um, translation factors that Absolutely. Like, uh, students that they have been a lot more comfortable taking up language. One, well, lots of people, but one thing, you can already market that drink what you have for in order. Well, come to me, not to the, the company, and I'll, I'll hook you up. But. Infant formula. formula, absolutely. The issue would be that this earlier, still in this case, we would probably be better not to breastfeed a child if we are in a position of poverty or have significant infant level shelter and rent that you have to have to pay. That's one thing that would be interesting. Absolutely. So there's a few things. Um, so, so let me talk. Uh, let me speak to your your first question. And I think as far as cortisol goes, it's a super complex molecule, right? We know that it plays roles in, in critical roles in just survival. You know, it's it's a metabolic hormone at heart. Um, and I think the the question here is 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 milk cortisol the same as the endogenous cortisol that an infant is is producing in response to stress? And I don't think they are. I don't think they play the same role. I think uh, milk cortisol interacts with the infant in a different way. So there's some, rodent, there some rodent work that suggests that prior to weaning, the glucocorticoid receptor is widely expressed along the entire GI tract. And then after that, uh, those receptors are downregulated. And so the body is paying attention to milk cort in a very specific way and potentially in a different way than it is that endogenous cortisol. And so I, I kind of brushed over this because I'm going to go over it more uh, during my talk talk. But I, I do think that cort in milk is a potentially protective factor. Um, specifically, what, how, I, ca I can't say. And I think that until we make that connection that it is 
improving or at least supporting neurodevelopment, then there's no sense in trying to figure out mechanistically what's happening. So the very first step in this program of research is to establish whether or not milk cortisol is predictive of neurodevelopment. And so what I would predict is that if you look at children in poverty that are breastfed, their developmental trajectories are going to look very, very similar to, to um, high-income families, regardless of breastfeeding, because in, in those high-resource environments, you're kind of already at ceiling, since there are so many other aspects of, of the environment that can affect the brain. Um, you're, uh, and then the next, I wish I had written things down. <laughs> I, should have a, I should have a notepad. Um, so we were talking about quart and breast milk. Um, controlling for yes, controlling for microbiome. So we, can, so we can certainly do things like you know, controlling for mode of delivery and, and those very basic things. Um, there is work ongoing now at the University of Minnesota with a collaborator, Dan Knights, who's actually getting um, swabs from the birth canal, meconium, um, as well as longitudinal uh, uh, fecal samples to see exactly what we need to be controlling for. So do we, in order to find these patterns in the microbiome that are meaningful for later outcomes, do we need to get a, a swab during, during delivery, and that's, that's possible. Um, on the animal side of things, Tracy Bale has a beautiful model of intergenerational transmission of stress effects based on effects on maternal microbiome. So it certainly has something to do with it there, and that's another avenue for this research. I'm not sure, I'm in mean, this first project, if that's something, uh, but I think that the best we can do right now is to, is to look at um, the, the factors that we know th that certainly affect the microbiome, so things like vaginal delivery and breastfeeding itself. Um, I've also looked at microsocial coding and seeing contact, kissing, those kinds of things, if that's something uh, that is also predictive. But then that also correlates with things like maternal sensitivity and, and other kind of maternal constructs that uh, are also part of the model. So it's a complex web, for sure. So that's, that's a great question, and I think the overall infant growth is something that we know people are digging into, particularly in relation to breastfeeding. And so Ellen Demarath is one example, um, but we, there are lots of studies looking at adiposity as well as, so not just kind of, you know, if you're heavier, but where you're carrying that kind of weight. Um, I'm trying to think of other, other work, but I, in my view, if I can find collaborators that are that are well versed in those things, then I, I do like to take a more holistic view, for sure. Um, and I, I think the just the infant growth literature is probably the best place to start. And just looking at, at things like adiposity, I don't know, at least in babies, if things like um, you know cardiac health and those things are, are often um, studied, and if we can determine risk earlier, in you know with cardiac things, and that certainly somewhere else to go. Um, but I think adiposity and kind of just metabolism in general is probably the, the first place to start. The immune system is certainly another place. Uh, so there's lots of work looking at specific breast milk factors, um, you know, immunoglobulins and cytokines, and how those affect uh, food allergy. But that's a very, very specific and kind of narrow focus. And so expanding those potentially to see how they parallel changes in the brain and behavior is certainly something else to look at. That's a, that's a great, great question. Um, and so, so your first question, uh, so we're doing our best with antibiotics. So the original study um, was, again, just supposed to be preliminary data. And so I was getting parent report of antibiotic use. Uh, for baby connectome, we'll likely dig into medical records, but that is a really long, arduous process. 
And so we're still, at least for these initial analyses, relying on, on parent report. And that being said, parents will often say, yes, they had a course for a couple weeks. I have no idea what it was. Um, so, so for our study, we're looking at it more as a, as a nuisance variable. There are other studies that, oh, 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 absolutely. Absolutely. So, so by nuisance variable, I mean we're, we are controlling for the effects, but not necessarily at the, the level of the kind of antibiotic. So it won't be able to get at that question of, of susceptibility. Um, there is a, an ongoing study at CHOP um, that is looking at specific kinds of antibiotics and timing. And so in that study, they actually had families call when kids were diagnosed with something that required oral antibiotics. They got a stool sample prior to the antibiotic, and then I think one a week after or something like that to answer these very, very specific questions. Um, and then your other question was about um, the differences in breastfeeding between Minnesota and Chapel Hill. Um, Chapel Hill is more nationally representative, representative and so most of those uh, babies are, uh, aren't getting breastfed past six months. Minnesota is a very weird place for breastfeeding. I think it's a good place for breastfeeding. Um, I don't know if you noticed in my plot, we have a few samples out after 30 months. And so we have lots of our moms are going up to two years with breastfeeding. And that's not at all nationally representative. I think it is representative of the Twin Cities area and the, the demographic that, that we're capturing. Um, so there, there are certainly potentially differences based on site. And that's we'll include site in all of our all of our analyses are potentially, if we're looking at those later ages, then we'll just be restricted to the Minnesota sample. Any, uh, I have a question. If anybody on the video would like to ask a question, go ahead. Yeah, I, I have a real quick one, which is, I mean, it's fascinating to me the papers you showed earlier that just show how long some of these impacts of breastfeeding last. And it seems like pretty consistently that it seems to last in all these different things. And you mentioned the cognitive one as well as uh, Weight better development, of course, with into, into ch you know children, you can still see the effects of that, even when people are 15 or 16 adolescents. And I was just curious if there's any data about, or if you know of anything. I mean, has anybody looked at whether that, or is there even any, even any research that tracks it into adulthood? Um, because it seems to have some strong effects. I was just curious to see if they've, if when people are young adults or even in the middle age, if there's any research on that at all. Um, I'm not yeah. sure. I heard I heard your question very well. Um, I'm terrible oh. at hearing. <laughs> okay. Think uh, over. Try, try it again. Ben. I'm sorry. You get closer to your speaker, maybe. I will. Um, I, I, I okay? think it's me, not him. <laughs> so I was my my question was just uh, I was fascinated by how long this seems to last in the adolescence of strong effects, and I was just curious as to if you know if there's any work tracking this into adulthood, uh, if you could if you could see the effects of of uh, breastfeeding into young adults or or middle aged adults. You know I. I don't know that there, that there is, so it's, it's hard. So in the breastfeeding world, um, there are, there's lots of interest during infancy, and most of the adult studies or those long-term studies weren't prospective, and so it's all retrospective uh, you know, recall. And I don't know about you, but I'm not sure how long I was breastfed. Um, and so you know, if you ask me, and, and that's often the method that they'll use, right? They'll say, oh, well, were you breastfed? Yes. I, um, and so, it, so no, I don't think we have great data, and, that, and that's part of why I really think we need to be focusing on these prospective studies. And, and, and I mean, it'll be hard to go out into adulthood, but I mean, there's work coming out of, you know, out of Virginia Tech that's showing that, you know, early education interventions last for decades. And that's, you know, that's something that, you know, hopefully we'll be able to show in using these prospective and kind of, um, I like to think of them as more, uh, you know, designs with foresight in that, you know, we might not necessarily understand or know uh, specifically what is happening entirely in breast milk, but we'll have samples and we'll be able to, to look at some of those questions you know, later down the road as well. Thank you. Okay, if there are no further questions, please join me in 